Welcome to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast with your host, Jim Robinson. Hello, and welcome back to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Robinson. On today's episode, we're getting into the middle of July, and it's that time of year to start scouting for Western Bean Cutworm. The flights have, start, have started happening, and we need to talk a little bit about what to do to uh, scout for the Western Bean Cutworm, as well as any control measures that may be necessary. Today with us, we have our product evaluation lead, Nate Meyer. Nate, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Jim. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. So, Nate, why should we care about Western Bean Cutworm? Well, I think one of the main reasons we need to worry about Western Bean Cutworm is, well, a couple things can happen there. First, every farmer wants top yields. So one of the main things we need to worry about is yield loss uh, due to ear feeding from the Western Bean Cutworm. Uh, second one we need to worry about is if they're feeding earlier, we can have some deformed, uh, some stunt ears uh, if they're feeding early like that. And the last one and an important one for some regions is uh, anytime you have open ear up like that through feeding, uh, it really increases the chance for any mold or fungal ear rot. Um, you run a lot higher risk for alpha toxins, fumamus, uh, fumonacin, and uh, different ones like that. That could really um, hurt your yield as well as make that grain not marketable for uh, some areas. Exactly. Not just not marketable, but also if, if you're feeding on your own farm, then then actually detrimental to your operation. Yeah, uh, small amounts of alpha toxin can be quite poisonous to mm. uh, certain animals. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about the Western bean cutworm? You know, where is it? And tell us a little bit about its life cycle as well. So um, I, I cover the Western area for Rob Seco's footprint, and that's where we mainly concerned about the Western bean cutworm. It, it seems to really be predominantly in the sandier soils. As we move further west, uh, technically, usually we have sandier, lighter soils like that, and they really key on those soils. So what we look at, there's only one generation per year of the um, Western bean cutworm. Um, so right now we're looking at the moth flight, but before that they're, they're, they're in the soil um, in their pupal form, uh, pupation in the spring, and then the, the uh, moss emerge. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're having probably flight started as we move south and west uh, a little bit earlier, uh, getting to central Nebraska area now. Uh, probably mid-flight, I'd say. So Mid-flight around mid-July or so. Mid-July. Yeah. So we're about mid-July right now. Yep. So um, after that, we're looking for eggs uh, to be laid in the upper canopy uh, of the corn plant. Um, the western bean cutworm moths usually key on pre-tassel hybrids. Uh, they want a V16 to V18 um, laying in the you know top leaves there because... After the eggs hatch, what happens is the larva will want to feed up into the tassel where it'll, they'll be in the world still protected and um, not have a lot of predators and kind of tough for any insecticides if you're spraying too early to get to them. Um, after the tass tassel emerges, you'll see them make their uh, slow descent down to the ear. Um, and that's when we're going to find that they're... Um, probably the best chance if we have to do an insecticide treatment to get them. Uh, Cause as soon as they're in the ear, it, it's almost impossible to uh, treat them as well. So. Absolutely. That, that husk and that flag leaf will definitely protect those larvae as they're up in the tassel and down in the ear. Right. Yeah. And so now when, when a moth lays its eggs, you know, how, how do you typically recognize those eggs? You know, do, do they lay a single egg? Is it clusters? What do you see? So when we're looking for the eggs on the top leaves there, we look for clusters of eggs. Uh, usually uh, anywhere from as small as five to, to large ones up to 200. Um, and they're pretty noticeable. They're not overlapped. They're all spaced out. Um, um, if you've seen them before, they're pretty identifiable. Identifiable. Um, you know, they can be multiple colors. Usually they start off as a, a very white creamish, and as further along they move before they hatch, uh, the darker they become. Mm -hmm. Becoming almost a purple color. Almost a purple they... at the end, yes. Yep. Exactly. And so, you know, if you if you open up a tassel, you know, after eggs have hatched, it's it's really fun to actually look in with a micro, not a microscope, but a magnifying glass uh, to see the little larvae uh, feeding on the pupil, uh, pupil sacs, the pollen sacs. Pollen sacs. Uh, 
and uh, uh, before they migrate down to the ear. So once they get to the ear, what do they do? How do they get in and, and what damage might they cause? So usually if we're looking for them in the ear, uh, they're entering through the tip of the ear. Um, that's where most of the feeding is going to occur. Um, also, in some cases, you'll see them bore right through the husk into the center of the ear. Um, uh, pretty noticeable there when we see those uh, out in the fields. Pretty pretty easy to know what happened there. Mm -hmm. um, so, How does that differ from, say, corn earworm? So corn earworm, uh, one thing you're going to find is that corn earworm is going to be cannibalistic. So if you see one of these um, large worms in there and you only find one, uh, chances are that's going to be corn earworm. Uh, one of the things with Western bean cutworm, you can find multiple in the same, same ear. Uh, very common to find two per ear, um, mm -hmm. causing a lot of damage. Exactly. And then on top of that, uh, Western bean cutworm, like you said, will bore into the side of the ear, whereas corn earworm, the eggs are laid on the, the silks themselves right. and will migrate in uh, via the silk channels. Yep. After they feed on the ear, you know, how, how do they then complete the cycle uh, as that larvae uh, matures? So after they mature, what they're going to do is they are going to uh, move down to the soil surface again and, and um, pretty much crawl under the ground, and that's where they're going to pupate, uh, uh, make earth and pupil cells to overwinter. Um, so this is why it's a continuing um, problem as we look to our western footprint and at times, uh, they can move even further east. Um, you know, we key on the western part, but some years we're going to see them into South Dakota. We'll see them into eastern Iowa. Um, it, so it, it's something that we need to be watchful for every year. Exactly. Some of those sandy soils, as you move east into parts of Wisconsin, Illinois, you can even find them in Indiana some years. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. How do you scout for western bean cutworm? You know, when, when should you start? How do you know when to start? And what do you look for out in the field to know if you should consider treatment options? So one of the good things about Nebraska is they have a um, pretty good system set up with blacklight traps for the moths. Um, so what they'll do is they'll have them out starting um, beginning of June, uh, monitoring the flight. So that's one way you can go online. You can follow and see how many what the flight's like at this time. And after we have um, confirmed flight, um, as we're getting the corn to the right stage, uh, it's best to go out there and ground proof everything. Um, take five different spots of the field, um, walk a bunch of different plants, look at the upper leaves, because um, as soon as we hit about five to eight percent um, plants that have egg masses on there, it's time to start thinking about treatment if you don't have um, something like a Viptera corn. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Viptera. What kind of control can you get with various traits um, you know, to mitigate the need to use an insecticide? So there's a couple different traits that will have some efficacy on the western bean cutworm. Um, obviously, agriculture Viptera um, has been phenomenal. Um, it has a very, very high level of control. Um, uh, it, it is the one that I, I'd go to, I'd recommend, if western bean cutworm is going to be an issue in your fields. Um, also, the Herculex-1, the uh, Cry-1F protein, has control as well, but not at the highest high level as Viptera. Um, Viptera is 95 to 99%, I'd say, in most cases, where Cry-1F is probably going to be 80% mm -hmm. at the best. Exactly. And actually, when, when Cry-1F was introduced as in Herculex-1, it was... Uh, it only ever started at about 80 percent and since then we find pockets that resistance has developed and so you may get 80 percent uh control or suppression with uh herculex one but that may not always be uh feasible if if there's resistance in your area right and, and even 20 percent of a larva still feeding is enough to cause significant damage in a cornfield exactly so let's talk a little bit about insecticides because not all hybrids will, will have these traits on them and therefore other control measures may be necessary. Uh, so you said if, if there's a 5 to 8% infestation or at least 5 to 8% of plants have egg masses, uh, you should consider a, a treatment. How should you try to time that? Because you mentioned earlier that if the larvae make it to the rolled tassel or down into the ear, it's pretty difficult to control. So the key time that we're looking for um, chemical control of these insects would be when we see about 95% of the tassels out in the field. Uh, that means that they're making their perilous journey from the uh, tassel down to the silks. 
And that's when they're going to be exposed. Um, that's when you're going to be able to control them with uh, many different types of insecticides. There's a lot of labeled insecticides. Um, so, you know, talk to your chemical provider, find out which one uh, is going to work the best in your area. Um, just like uh, any herbicides, I suggest rotating different modes of action between the herbicides, just in case um, any s- sort of resistance is out there. Absolutely. We've already seen uh, a genetic tolerance to traits, and so we might expect that in the future we could run into the resistance for insecticides. Exactly. As well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, Nate, basically what you've told us is that in particularly the western geographies with a lot of sandy soils, such as central and western Nebraska, western Kansas, eastern Colorado, and down to the panhandle Texas, you'll run into a high predominance of western bean cutworm. And that geography can grow or shrink in different years depending on conditions, particularly in areas where sandy soils have uh, are predominant in that area. Now, the western bean cutworm will overwinter in those areas, and then uh, moth flights begin sometime in, in late June into July, where uh, different universities like University of Nebraska will provide moth trap data to, to indicate when it's a good time to start scouting for egg masses on the top leaves. If you find egg masses, 5 to 8% of, egg, uh, of plants with egg masses, it's probably worth considering a control measure. If you have Agrisure viptera, that's probably your best uh, control measure that you could possibly get. Otherwise, an insecticide might be necessary. And otherwise, you may end up seeing feeding on your uh, your ears in your field, which could cause yield loss, ear deformities, or even uh, uh, infestation of fumonisins and aflatoxins from different ear molds and rots. Anything else you'd like to add? You know, Jim, I think you summarized it up there very well. It, it, it's an ongoing concern that we have. And... Um, what I've seen in the field by far, our, our best option, our best protection is having a Viptera product out there. Um, it, it's been great. Um, as I work with people in the West, if they find egg masses on their Viptera corn, they're not even worried about it. Um, they, they've seen it work year after year it, with high level of efficiency. So they feel pretty safe having it out there. Absolutely. That's a great comment. Well, thank you, Nate, so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Perfect. And Be sure to tune in on the 1st and 15th of every month for new episodes. And until then, stay field ready. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. Join us next time to be field ready. A Parkville Media Production.